Okay, let's get ready for the next plenary lecture. Please have a seat. Um, it's my great honor to introduce our plenary speaker, Fernando Coda Marquez. Fernando got his master's degree from IMPA and PhD degree from Cornell University in 2003. His thesis advisor was Jose Escobar. Jose Escobar was my academic brother, and he pass passed away prematurely, six months after Fernando finished. But two years later, Fernando spent a crucial year at Stanford University to work under the guidance of Richard Shane, his academic grandfather. Fernando has been working at IMPA as professor since 2003. Initially, he made several major contributions in the area of geometric PDEs. Fernando solved the compactness conjecture in the Yamabe problem for spin manifolds, and he constructed counterexamples to minus conjecture in general relativity. And he proved the connectedness of the space of positive scalar curvature metrics in dimension three. About two years ago, Fernando proved the celebrated Wilmer conjecture together with André Novesh. This was a surprising news because many mathematicians had been trying to prove the Wilmer conjecture in vain for almost 50 years. From this success, he became the winner of three prizes, the Ramanujan Prize of ICTP, the TWAS Prize, and the UMA LCA Prize. Fernando was an invited speaker at the ICM in Hyderabad, and this year he became a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Starting next month, Fernando will be professor of Princeton University. Today, the title of his plenary lecture is Minimal Surfaces, Variational Theory and Applications. Let's welcome Fernando. Okay, uh, thank you, Jay Gang, for a kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to say that I'm thankful to the International Mathematical Union for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to deliver this plenary talk at, at this ICM. So uh, today I'm going to talk about an old subject in differential geometry, namely the subject of minimal surfaces. So minimal surfaces are among the most natural objects uh, in geometry. And they, they have been studied for the past 250 years, ever since the pioneering work of, of Lagrange. So it's a, it's a subject marked by a profound beauty. But perhaps even more remarkably, uh, minimal surfaces or minimal submanifolds uh, in general are fundamental tools in the solution of various problems coming from different fields like free manifold topology, mathematical physics, conformal geometry, and so on. It's a very large field, so I do not have the pretension of being exhaustive here. My goal today will be to describe to you uh, recent advances in the variational theory of these objects with emphasis on applications to other domains. So let's get started. All right, so um, minimal submanifolds are solutions of a very basic variational problem. It's a problem of extremizing the, the area. It goes back to Lagrange, who in 17... 62 ask the question of existence of surfaces of least area with some given contour in three spaces, the boundary. So what Lagrange did was to derive the differential equation a function must satisfy so that its graph is a solution to, to this problem. So this is the equation. It's a very nice equation. It's a quasi-linear elliptic partial differential equation. But from the general look of it, it doesn't seem so easy to, to provide explicit examples. So Meniere was the, was the one who discovered that the, this equation is 
equivalent to a geometric property. That's the vanishing of the mean curvature. And the differential geometry of the surfaces got started. So let me talk about curvature now. So let's say we have a two-dimensional surface in uh, Euclidean 3 space. So I would like to define curvatures at a given point. So you fix a point, take the perpendicular direction to the surface at that point. One looks at planes passing through the point and containing the perpendicular direction. So each such plane will intersect the surface at a planar curve, which has a curvature at the point P. So as you rotate the plane, these curvatures will, will vary. And if you think of this curvature as a function of the direction of the section, it turns out that this is given by a quadratic form. It's called the second fundamental form, whose eigenvalues are called principal curvatures, here represented by K1 and, and K2. So geometrically, the principal curvatures are the maximum and minimum curvatures among all sections. So once you have the principal curvatures, you can define the classical notions of curvature of a surface in three space. One can take the average of those two numbers, that's the mean curvature H, or we, one can define uh, the Gauss curvature K as the product. So the Gauss curvature K, by an amazing uh, discovery of Gauss, is an intrinsic uh, quantity. The mean curvature H, by contrast, is extrinsic, and it's, it's linked to the problem of extremizing the area through the so-called first variation formula. So there's the formula. So uh, the formula tells you what the first derivative of the area should be at time zero along some given variation with initial velocity given by a vector field x. So the, the right-hand side gives you minus the integral over the surface of the velocity dotted with the mean curvature vector. The mean curvature vector is just the normal vector with length given by the mean curvature at every point plus a boundary term. So the exact same formula holds in a more general setting of a k-dimensional submanifold in an n-dimensional Riemannian manifold, same formula. So in particular, if we restrict ourselves to, to variations that keep the boundary fixed, in other words, those for which the velocity vector vanishes on the boundary, then this derivative is going to be zero for every x if and only if the mean curvature vector vanishes. That's the definition of a minimal submanifold. Okay. So it's a very rich theory with lots of beautiful and explicit uh, examples. Here are just a, a few of them. I think these pictures are due to Matthias Weber, your final one from the MSRI website. So the first four are, are classical ones. The last two were discovered uh, more recently. There are lots and lots of beautiful examples. But in R3, this is one fact that follows sort of easily from the maximum principle. One cannot find minimal surfaces of closed type. There are no closed minimal surfaces in R3. On the other hand, by the pioneering work of Blaine Lawson, one gets the feeling that there should be lots of closed minimal surfaces uh, in compact ambient spaces. In fact, he proved that for the standard S3 with unit length, unit radius, there are closed minimal surfaces of, of every genus. That's what he proved. Well, as I say, very rich of examples. Um, you know, people have been studying also uh, such examples in more general homogeneous three-dimensional ambient geometries. Okay. So these objects can also be uh, modeled by soap films. So because Joseph Plateau was the physicist who, in the 19th century, uh, performed several experiments with such films, the question that I mentioned in the beginning that was actually raised by Lagrange became known as the Plateau's problem. So this became a central question uh, in the field until it was solved in 1930 independently by Douglas and, and Radal. So the surfaces they considered are always given by uh, mappings from the unit disk in two dimensions. But we can also solve the plateau problem in, in Riemannian manifolds as well. So the search for solving the plateau's problem uh, in greater generality 
by allowing arbitrary topological type and also arbitrary dimension led to the development of geometric measure theory. So the idea is that one would like to uh, interpret surfaces in some measure theoretic sense so that one could replace smooth surfaces by more general objects which would satisfy better uh, compactness properties. So that's exactly what was done by Federer and Fleming in 1960 who introduced integral currents. So one should think of an integral current as a Lipschitz submanifold with integer multiplicities. So what they proved was that in such a space one can actually solve the minimization problem by the direct method of the calculus of variations. Namely, you just pick a minimizing sequence and you take a limit. So in particular, they proved that for a, in every non-trivial homology class in a given compact Riemannian manifold, there exists an area minimizing integral current. So it can, only, can always be represented by an area minimizing guy. Of course, the remaining work to be done is consists in studying the regularity of, of such objects, which in principle could be singular. So the regularity was studied by many people over the years, in particular by Jim Simons, who, who spoke here in this Congress. The, be the best results are for the case of, of co-dimension one. We should have in mind this example. This is the Simons cone. So it's a perfectly nice, uh, seven-dimensional area minimizing object sitting inside Euclidean space with an isolated singularity at the origin. So singularities are there, they happen in higher dimensions and there's not much one can do about it. An important source of area minimizing uh, submanifolds comes from the theory of calibrations of Harvey and Lawson linked to differential forms. So recall that a, a calibration of some k-dimensional submanifold sigma is a closed k-form omega that has the property that it's bounded by one everywhere, but when restricted to the submanifold, it's actually equal to one times the volume, times the volume form. So when such differential forms exist, exist, it, it follows very easily from the Stokes theorem that one can compare the volumes or the, or the k area of two homologous surfaces. In particular, every calibrated submanifold is area minimizing. So this uh, include uh, important classes like minimal graphs, complex submanifolds, special Lagrangian submanifolds in Calabi-Yau spaces. So in particular, they are all calibrated and therefore they are all area minimizing objects. So area minimizing submanifolds are in particular stable, which means that the second variation of the area is non-negative for any variation that keeps the, the boundary fixed. One can compute the, the second variation of the area. It's given by this, by this formula, by this quadratic form in X. Formula is, is a bit complicated, but it simplifies a lot in codimension one. <clears throat> so the stable submanifolds are those for which this expression is non negative for every vector field X. One can define the Morse index, as in any variational theory, the Morse index is defined to be the index of this quadratic form. So this is the maximum dimension of a subspace restricted to which the second variation is negative definite. It's a very important number in variational theory. And here's an example of an open problem. So it's a beautiful extension of the Bernstein theorem that any complete orientable stable minimal surface in R3 must be a plane. This was proven independently by Ducarmo Peng, Fischer Cobri and Shen, and Pogorelov. So it turns out that the classification of the stable minimal hypersurfaces in higher dimensions is an open problem. So we don't even know whether there are non-trivial examples in R4. There are certainly non-trivial examples for high dimensions, but the for example, the R4 case is completely open. Okay, so uh, closed minimal surfaces can be constructed by a variety of methods. Let me just mention a few of those. 
So one can try to minimize the Dirichlet energy in a non-trivial homotopy class and produce incompressible minimal surfaces in Riemannian manifolds. So this in general produces a minimal immersion uh, with branch points. These are in general immersed. Uh, one can also produce embedded objects by minimizing area in an isotopic class. It's the work of Nick Simon Yao. And there's also a theory to, to produce uh, minimal two spheres in compact Riemannian manifolds. Again, the idea is that you try to minimize the energy over all maps whose domain is a two-dimensional sphere in some homotopy class, for instance. But there are some extra difficulties coming from, from the fact that the group of conformal transformations of S2, that's the symmetry of the problem, is actually non-compact. So new, new techniques have had to be developed by Sachs and Uhlenbeck in this paper. It's a really seminal paper in the field. There are many applications of, of such uh, constructions. For instance, I mentioned here the proof of Siu and Yao of the Frankel conjecture. So this also follows from, from the work of Professor Mori and the work of Mikhail F. Moore. It's a beautiful paper where they study the topology of manifolds with positive isotropic curvature by using constructions of minimal spheres. Okay, so at this point, let me mention a little bit in more detail one application of minimal hypersurfaces of minimizing type to general relativity, mathematical physics. This is the proof of the positive mass conjecture by Shen and Yao, 1979. So Witten, two years later, gave a completely different proof using harmonic spinners. I'm going to describe the Shen Yao's proof because this uses minimal surfaces. So there's a physical statement, but in the end, uh, the theorem can be reduced to a purely a Riemannian statement. So one considers three-dimensional uh, manifolds that are asymptotically flat with some precise asymptotics. So the leading term in the asymptotics comes from this Schwarzschild black hole solution. So the total mass is just the number m, the parameter in the asymptotics. And the physical condition on the space is translated into the assumption that the scalar curvature is non-negative everywhere. And scalar curvature is this geometric invariant that gives you the average curvature of a point in, spa in the space. So the theorem says that under these conditions, the mass, total mass, should be strictly positive unless the manifold is the flat three-dimensional Euclidean space. So the proof of Shen and Yao is by, is by contradiction. Their idea is that if the mass is negative, they are able to construct an area minimizing minimal surface sigma by taking limits of solutions to plateau problems. This is represented by the red line in the picture. The idea then is, well, this is area minimizing, therefore it's stable, and this con stability condition gives you this tells you that this inequality must hold for every function f with compact support just by picking the variation x to be f times the normal. And then the trick is to try to plug in the constant function one, which you cannot really do because it doesn't have compact support. But after an approximation argument, you can do it and you reach a contradiction with the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. So perhaps this idea is, is in, you know, becomes simpler in the compact setting. The same, the same argument can be used to prove that the three-dimensional torus does not admit a metric of positive scalar curvature. The idea is that any three-dimensional torus must contain an area minimizing two-dimensional torus just by minimizing incompressible, uh, incompressible tori. So when you combine the second variation formula along this torus, with the Gauss-Bonnet theorem, you, you, get a, you get a contradiction. It violates the, the Gauss-Bonnet theorem if the scalar curvature is positive. So the, the result is true for uh, higher dimensional tori also. This is, was proven by Gromov and Lawson using uh, spinorial techniques. So I should say that the positive mass conjecture remains uh, an open problem for non-spin manifolds of high dimensions. So uh, the proof of Shen and Yao <clears throat> sort of breaks down in dimension eight because this area minimizing hypersurfaces that one 
uh, constructs could be singular, so the argument gets messed up. On the other hand, the witness proof uh, works for any dimension, but it requires a topological assumption, namely that the manifold is spin. So in this uh, situation, it, 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 remains, it remains open. We also say that minimal surfaces model uh, parent horizons of black holes in general relativity. Okay, so, um, so far I have been uh, talking about um, minimal submanifolds of minimizing type, right? But most minimal submanifolds should be actually critical points, saddle, saddle critical points. As far as I know, the, the first person to, to realize the importance of constructing such unstable objects was Poincaré, who in 1905, he asked about the existence of closed geodesics in Riemannian two spheres. <clears throat> so if, if the surface has non-trivial genus, then you can easily produce a minimizing geodesic by just minimizing the length in some non-trivial homotopy class. But this doesn't work for S2. So the breakthrough here came from the work of Birkhoff in 1917, who introduced the Mimex method to the problem. So here the method is illustrated with a very simple uh, example. Basically in this example, one is able to detect the unstable critical point P1 by minimizing the maximum height over loops that go into the hole. This is the, so the critical value of the point P1 is a min-max value obtained exploiting this non-trivial topology of the space. So the idea is that one should replace the simple surface by the space of all curves, all closed curves in S2, and replace the height function by the area function. So the critical points will be minimal surfaces, or in, at least in this case, will be closed geodesics. <clears throat> so the, the key thing then is to discover this non-trivial topology. So that's what Birkhoff did by introducing the notion of sweep out. So a sweep out is a one parameter family of closed curves which cover your S2 in a topologically non-trivial way, like in this picture. You can think of those curves as being uh, images of the standard family of round, round circles by some map with degree equal to one. So these families would correspond to the, to the loops that go into the hole in, this, in the space of curves. So once you have the right notion of sweep out, you can perform the MIMEX procedure. So you, for each such sweep out, you look at the curve with maximum length, and then you minimize this number over the class of all sweep outs. And by doing so, you produce a number L. Birkhoff proves then that this number L is strictly positive, and it's always achieved by, as the length of some <clears throat> smooth closed geodesic. So, so the answer to Poincaré's question is yes, every Riemannian sphere must contain at least one closed geodesic. So the work of Birkhoff inspired the development of Morse theory and lusternich schneerman theory, which are theories that bring together the fields of topology and calculus of variations, where the idea is that you'd like to understand the structure of the critical points of a function in terms of the topology of the underlying space. So here's a very nice example. Uh, Lucernick and Schneerman proved the, the so-called three closed geodesics theorem, which says that actually if any Riemannian sphere must contain not only uh, one, but at, at least three distinct simple closed geodesics. Simple here means that they do not self-intersect, that they are embedded. So the proof was not uh, totally complete at the time, but it was completed later, but anyway, topological ideas were there. And what they realized was, uh, okay, so in Birkhoff's procedure, uh, one performs um, the MIMEX method over families that are modeled by these standard families of round circles in S2. But there are many more round circles to consider. In fact, the, one can parameterize the space of round circles by, by the three-dimensional projective space. Here's one way of, of doing it. 
So this three-dimensional projective space, of course, contains a two-dimensional projective space, which contains a one-dimensional projective space. So you have three different families to, to apply the MIMAX technique to. And then you, you, you produce your, your three closed geodesics. Okay. So finally, uh, at least finally in the case of geodesics, uh, in the 1990s, by combining the works of Franks and Bangert, so Nancy Hingston, who, who gave a beautiful lecture here at this Congress, also proved some quantitative results. So one can get the following theorem that any Riemannian sphere actually contains uh, infinitely many geometrically distinct closed geodesics. So the proof combines ideas from dynamics and, and calculus of variations. So the question that we are more interested in is what about the area function? So what what can we do in higher dimensions? In particular, how many minimal surfaces does a three manifold have? And of course, this suggests looking for some kind of most theory for, for minimal varieties. So the first step would then be to understand the topology of the space of hypersurfaces or, or the space of, of cycles, if you want, your underlying space. So the first step was done by Elmgren, 1960, in his PhD thesis. He computed the homotop groups of the space of cycles. I'm using the language of geometric measure theory, but one should think of these as closed hypersurfaces or closed submanifolds with integer multiplicities, if you want. So you have this space, and he was able to uh, compute the homotop groups in terms of the homology of, of the manifold. So a similar result holds for, mod for modulo two cycles where one replaces integer coefficients by coefficients in Z2. Which is an, is, this is an important class. For instance, in some situations, this is used to model unoriented surfaces, but it's actually crucial in the, the last theorem I will talk about in this talk. Again, the homotop groups are, can be computed by the homology of the manifold. In particular, if you, if you look at the formula, you see that the fundamental group in co-dimension one must be isomorphic to Z2, so there must be a non-trivial family. And I can describe to you this non-trivial family very easily. Well, you just look at the level sets of some most function. So this forms a one-parameter uh, family, a non-trivial one-parameter family of hypersurfaces sweeping out your, your Riemannian manifold. Okay. So just a little bit of, about the history of this, of this theory. Uh, after Elmgren computed this homotopy groups, he decided to, to devise a, a, a general MIMAX theory for this problem. So general in the sense that the theory applies to any dimension, any co-dimension, and also to any number of parameters involved in the families. So he proved the existence of some kind of minimal variety, but who, which could be singular, so he didn't succeed to, to, to prove the optimal regularity for the problem. But in 1980, his PhD student Pitts improved this regularity theory in the co-dimension one case by introducing this almost minimizing condition, which combined with work of Shannon Simon implied this, this theorem, which until very recently was the application of the elmgren pitts mimics theory. The theorem says that any compact Riemannian manifold with dimension between three and seven should contain a smooth, closed, embedded, minimal hypersurface. Of course, the restriction on the dimension here is just to guarantee that the minimal hypersurface we get is smooth. One can prove that in general, one can construct such objects with co-dimension seven singular sets if you want. But that was the application. There's always a minimal surface. So, uh, in general, this MIMAX minimal hypersurface could actually come in with several different connected components, which have to be disjoint from each other by, by the theory, and which could come with integer multiplicities. It's also very hard, in general, to say which minimal surface you are producing. But in some special situations, this is possible. 
For instance, one can tell the minimal surface we are producing if the ambient manifold is the three-dimensional unit sphere. So if you think about a general sweep out of a three-dimensional unit sphere, you see that eventually there will be a surface that divides the volume into equal parts, and when it does so, its area must be greater than or equal to four pi. On the other hand, there's an optimal sweep out just given by the level sets of some height function for which the soup is exactly four pi and is achieved by the equator. So the minimal surface here is the equator. The equator as a critical point for the variational problem has Morse index equal to one. And this is uh, compatible with the fact that we are producing the equator by one parameter families. So the, the, the number of parameters should match the index of the surface you're producing. Okay, so uh, in what follows, I would like to focus on applications of the MIMEX technique, but before I do so, let me mention some other recent advances uh, in minimal surface theory, which are not necessarily related to the variational theory. So I mentioned here the work of Cody and Minikazi on structure theory of embedded minimal surfaces, which was used by Mix and Rosenberg to prove the uniqueness of the helicoid. So the helicoid is the only embedded, simply connected minimal surface in R3, of course, besides the plane. Also mentioned Brando's proof of the Lawson conjecture, which is about the uniqueness of the Clifford Torres, minimal surface that will appear later in the stock. So he proved that the Clifford Torres is the only minimal embedded torus in S3. So the proof is based on a maximum principle technique, which extends some work done by Andrews on, on mean curvature flow. Also mentioned work of, of Liu on manifolds of, three manifolds of non-negative Ricci curvature, completing the work of Shen and Yao. In particular, as a byproduct, he proves Muner's conjecture in dimension three about the fundamental group of such manifolds. And I also mentioned some constructions of new examples of helicoidal type by Hoffman, Trezzi, and White. So it's definitely a, a very large field, as I, as I mentioned. Okay, so let's focus then on the, on the MIMAX technique. So I mentioned this sex ullenbeck approach in conjunction with minimization methods, right? When one looks at surfaces that are parameterized by two-dimensional spheres, given by mappings on the two-dimensional sphere. But you can also use, uh, uh, use this theory in the context of MIMAX methods. In fact, Cody and Minikazi used such ideas to, to find an application to a three-manifold uh, topology and the theory of Ricci flow. So recall that Ricci flow is this very famous equation introduced by Richard Hamilton in 1982 as some kind of nonlinear <clears throat> heat flow in the space of Riemannian metrics. So because of nonlinearities, one should expect, in general, uh, the singularities will form in finite time. I believe everyone here is well aware of the brilliant work of Perelman, who in three dimensions implemented a surgery process together with the analysis of the singularities. He proved, Perelman proved that if you start from a homotopy three sphere, then the flow always becomes extinct in finite time. So the idea is that, is that if the flow becomes extinct in finite time, then the, the number of surgeries is finite. And because the surgery is actually very simple, the, the reverse process is a connected sum, uh, is given by connected sum. So if you have finitely many surgeries, you can actually recover the original topology of, of your manifold and with that, he proved the Poincaré conjecture. So uh, he had to prove then that this flow becomes extinct in, in finite time. So how does one prove such finite time extinction? Well, the proof of Perelman was itself based on minimal surface techniques, also of some min max flavor, but he had some technicalities. So I'll just, I'll, I'll discuss this alternative argument provided by Codin and Minikazi where the idea is to analyze what happens to 
minimal spheres produced by mimics methods. So the, the idea is to study the evolution of the area of such minimal sphere and, and prove that eventually the area must, must go to zero. So this will tell you that the, the flow has to disappear in finite time. So a homotopy three sphere, you, know, you have non-trivial uh, uh, homotopy group, the third one, so you can, you can map, you can sweep out a homotopy sphere by mappings uh, defined on S2s, so one can perform mean max methods in the sachs ullenbeck uh, approach using energy instead of area. Anyway, you produce some, some, some minimal spheres. There's some technical work to be done here. But the idea is that you have this Mimex energy called the width, that's the number of W of T, for which we can prove some inequality. And if you look at the inequality, you see that for sufficiently large time, the number will eventually become negative. So the flow cannot, cannot exist for all time. So it's a very nice type of argument. Okay, so let's see how much time I have. Yes. So, so right, so, so in the remaining part of my talk, I would like to describe my joint work with Andre Nevis, who is going to uh, give a lecture tomorrow at 3 p.m., I believe, um, on applications of the MIMEX theory. So I will start by describing the Wilmer conjecture proposed in 1965, which was about this quest to find the best stars of all. So this is motivated by uh, a vague question. So you fix a surface of genus G, let's say, so you fix one of these topological types. So such a surface can present itself in a variety of ways in three-dimensional space. One would like to, to determine uh, the best one or the most beautiful one. Of course, we have to make this question mathematically precise. So we do that by considering the Wilmot energy. So the Wilmot energy of a closed surface in three space is simply defined as the integral over the surface of the square of the mean curvature. So this functional already appears as early as in the 1800s in the work of Sophie Germain. And it is the uh, simplest curvature functional that one can define that has the property of scale invariance, which is something that you'd like to do for this problem, you'd like to have for this problem. So that's the energy we would like to, to consider. And of the, the best shape then will be the, the shape that minimizes such energy. So this functional is invariant under scalings, as I just mentioned. Of course, it's also invariant under translations and, and rotations. But remarkably, it's actually invariant also under inversions. So it's invariant under any conformal transformation of R3. This was known already in the 1920s. So it's really a problem of, about the conformal geometry of surfaces in three space. Wilmer proved in the early 60s that the, the energy of any surface is greater than or equal to four pi. And that equality happens precisely when the surface is round. Right. So of course this is compatible with our feeling, right, that the, the, best, the best sphere should be the round one. <clears throat> it is the shape that minimizes the Wilmer energy among all surfaces in three space. It's not so clear what the answer should be if we restrict to the class of Terai. But Wilmer made a prediction, this is the Wilmer conjecture, 65. So he predicted that the energy of any torus immersed in three-dimensional space must be at least two pi square. So that was the, the, the optimal number that he, came up, that he came up with. So the perfect donut, if you want, uh, can be obtained as a torus of revolution, where the uh, rotating circle uh, is, is chosen in the following way. In the, such that it's such that the distance from the center of the circle to the axis of revolution must, divided by the radius of the circle, must be equal to square root of two. The only important thing here is the, is the ratio. So that's the, the surface 
Of course, any conformal image of that surface will be, again, a minimizer. This is the most symmetric one. So it turns out that this, uh, that this donut, that this torus, is actually the stereographic projection of the Clifford torus, which was already mentioned here. This is the definition of the Clifford torus, product of two circles of radius one over a square of two. This is a minimal torus sitting inside S3. So the stereographic projection is a, is a conformal map. So one can think of a surface in, in, in Euclidean three space as the shadow or as the projection of some surface in the, in the unit three sphere. And then you can translate completely the problem into a problem about surfaces seated inside the unit three sphere because of the conformal invariance of the problem. It's very convenient to do so because if you think, if you, if you compute the energy of a surface now sitting inside the three sphere, you see that the energy is always greater than or equal to the area of the surface. And it's actually equal when the surface is minimal. So there's a, when you go to S3, there is a relation with the area function. Okay. So there were many partial results towards the conjecture. I won't mention those here, but I refer to the proceedings paper for, for, for the references. I like to mention this particular one because this is relevant to our approach. This is a theorem of Li and Yao of 1982, which says that if your surface has a point that is covered k times, so you see k sheets of the surface passing through that point, then the energy should be at least four pi times k. So in particular, if the surface is not embedded, if it has some self-intersection, then already the energy gets greater than or equal to 8 pi, which is better than 2 pi square. So in other words, in order to prove the conjecture, we might as well assume that the surface is embedded. And that's what we do in the paper. So the Wilmer conjecture is one of these good problems in mathematics that inspire lots of activity around it. So still today, so many techniques had to be developed to, to produce, to prove existence results to study general critical points which are not necessarily minimizers. Those are called Wilmer surfaces. For each Robert Bryan classified critical points of genus zero, uh, Pinko constructed examples that are Torai. And also more recently, uh, thanks to the works of Kuven Schatzo and Riviere and others, uh, the, we, we have a very good understanding of the analytical aspects of the Wilmer equation. So this is a very active field today. Okay. So here is the main statement. It's joint with Andre. Nervous. So the theorem says that if you have a closed embedded surface in the unit three sphere with genus G greater than or equal to one, then the Wilmer energy of such a surface must be greater than or equal to two pi square. And equality holds if and only if the surface is conformal to the Clifford torus. So this implies that the Wilmer conjecture is true, but it proves more because the, it's, it establishes the two pi square bound for higher genus surfaces as well, which was not known before. It also proves the rigid statement and if we restrict to the class of minimal surfaces, we, we've seen here that the, for a minimal surface, the energy is equal to the area in S3. This theorem implies that any minimal surface in S3 that it's not an equator must have area greater than or equal to two pi square. In fact, this is the first result that we prove in our paper because the, the idea is to somehow reduce the conjecture to a problem about minimal surfaces. Okay, so we, so the key thing was to uh, understand the topological and geometrical properties of a new kind of sweep out that we have found in S3. This is a five parameter family of surfaces in S3 that we were able to use to produce the Clifford torus as a min max minimal surface. So uh, uh, 
we have, we have seen here that the equator can be produced by min-max methods just by doing minimax over the standard one parameter sweep outs. So what we did was to, to find the right families to do the same for the Clifford torus. The Clifford torus has Morse index equal to five. So again, the, the index matches the number of parameters. So let me describe uh, the behavior of this family now. So for each, we start with a closed embedded surface in S3. Then associated to that surface, we construct a family that we call the canonical family associated to sigma. This is a family of surfaces sigma vt, where v is a vector in the open unit ball, and t is a parameter which varies from minus pi to pi, so you can see that there are five parameters involved. The family is really explicit, so each such surface is, is the equidistance of some conformal image of sigma. But anyway, this family has the following properties. So it contains the surface you started with and the areas never go above the Wilma energy of the original guy. So the area of each surface in the family is bounded from above by the Wilma energy of sigma. So this inequality actually follows from, from inequalities of, of Ross and also some more general inequalities of Heinz Karker. Okay. So here's the behavior of the family. So the parameter space is a solid cylinder. It's a product of the unit four ball with the interval minus pi to pi, five dimensional space. So for each point X inside the, the solid cylinder, we associate some closed surface in three space, like in the picture, which might have some genus. So the points at the top and at the bottom of the cylinder are sent into surfaces with zero area. So those are the trivial element in the space of cycles. So the, the family is constant at those regions. But the interesting behavior happens when X approaches the boundary because suddenly all the genus disappears and the surfaces turn into perfectly nice round spheres. It's an interesting kind of behavior. So if you look, if you pick a vector V in S3, that's the boundary of the full ball. And if you look at the surfaces associated to, a, to this vertical blue line, let's say passing through V, the surfaces will look like that. They will form a standard foliation of S3 by round spheres centered at some point Q, which might depend on V. So the centers are, are varying, but at the boundary, everything is a round sphere. One should imagine that the surface is sort of being dilated in S3, so all the genus will collapse or disappear in the end and the surface becomes round. That's, what, that's what's going on. Okay. So we use the following theorem of Urbano, which was proven in 1990. So this theorem says that the Clifford torus and the great sphere are the only minimal surfaces in S3 with index bounded from above by five. So the Clifford torus has index exactly equal to five and the great sphere, the equator has, has index one. So this theorem is important because by an analogy with most theory, one should expect that if we do mean max over five parameter families, the resulting minimal surface will have index bounded by five. So this is, this is what we had in mind. So we thought, okay, so we want to prove this conjecture and we have found uh, a very nice uh, sweep out with a very nice bound for, for the areas. So we thought, okay, so we're going to apply MIMAX theory to this, to this family. We, of course, we will let the family vary by homotopies and we apply the MIMAX procedure. So there are all sorts of technical issues there, but in the end, we're going to be able to produce a minimal surface. And the area of this minimal surface will be a lower bound for the original Wilma energy because of the area inequality. So we thought that inspired by most theory that we would be able to prove that this minimal surface will have index bounded by five. So this theorem would tell us that it must be either the Clifford torus or the great sphere. And then we thought, okay, that we have to 
work hard to find some topological ingredient in order to be able to rule out the possibility of producing great spheres in the end. Right? So if, we, if we do min max and get a great sphere, the bound you find is full pi, not two pi square. So we were quite excited when we found this ingredient. When, so we discovered that the topological degree of the center map is exactly equal to the genus of the surface that you started with. So in other words, the, the genus of the original surface, which is somehow sitting inside the solid cylinder, can be computed just by looking at the centers of those round spheres on the boundary. All right. This is quite remarkable. In particular, if the genus is greater than or equal to one, this is telling us that, this, that the boundary of the cylinder gets mapped onto the space of round spheres in some homotopically non-trivial way. So we found some new non-trivial topology that wasn't there before. Okay. Here I, I try to illustrate the, the proof with a, a picture. Of course, this is an oversimplification, right? because in particular, we don't have the index estimate that I just mentioned. So it turns out that we have so much structure for these canonical families that we can bypass this fact. But anyway, it's good to have this picture so, so that one gets a clear picture of what's going on in the proof. So the picture in the left here is supposed to represent the space of surfaces in S3, and the height function is representing the area function. Of course, the critical points of the area function are the minimal surfaces. So there is the minimal surface, the critical point uh, down there with area four pi represents the equator. There's another critical point that sigma hat, a little bit higher, with area two pi square. So that's the Clifford torus. So we start from, from a surface sigma which somehow sitting inside this space. And we start deforming the surface very explicitly in five different directions. That's the canonical family. So we do these deformations in such a way that the area never goes above the Wilmer energy of the original guy, like in the picture. And then what's going on is that the fact that the genus, is greater, the genus of the original surface is greater than or equal to one can be used to prove through this degree calculation. It re requires some extra argument with homology, but because the center map was topologically non-trivial, if the genus is greater than or equal to one, the family will go into the hole, as in the picture. And by going into the hole, it must contain a surface that, is, that has more area than the Clifford torus. But the areas were bounded by the Wilmore energy, and, and, and you, there you go, you, you finish the proof. That's sort of a scheme of, of the argument. Okay, so then we uh, were able to solve a very similar problem, or an analogous problem, about links in R3 that I'd like to mention now. It's a problem about two component links. So these are pairs of disjoint curves in R3. So the linking number is this invariant that measures the number of times one curve goes into the other. Right. So the uh, turns out that there is an energy associated to these links. It's called the Möbius cross energy, which happens to be conformal invariant, just like the Wilmot energy. It's given by this very simple formula, only involving first derivatives of, of the curves. So it's conformal invariant. There are some bounds that one can prove using Gauss formula for the linking number. But anyway, it's natural then to, to search for the optimal configuration. That would be the uh, the, the, the non-trivial link that minimizes the, the Möbius energy. So the friedman hay wang conjecture proposed in 1994 said that the energy of any two component link in R3 with link number equal to plus or minus one should be at least two pi square. Again, two pi square. Okay. So this would imply the result for non-trivial links. So here's the theorem. This is joint work with Ian Ego, who also spoke here in the Congress. 
and Andre Neves is going to speak tomorrow. So we, we proved that the conjecture is true, that the energy is always greater than or equal to two pi square, and moreover, that if equality holds, the link must be conformal to the standard Hopf link given by those formulas. Well, the, the idea is just is to look at the, very briefly, is to look at the Gauss map of, of a link and to use such Gauss maps to construct some five parameter family of surfaces with areas bounded by the Möbius energy. It's a different family of surfaces, but with the same structural properties of, of the Wilmer family. And in the end, the degree of the center map will be equal to plus or minus one, depending on whether the linking number is plus or minus one. So then the theory applies. Okay, so I have just a few minutes, so I'll go very briefly over the last topic here. This is motivated by a conjecture of Yao. So Yao conjectured in 1982 that every compact Riemannian three manifold admits an infinite number of smooth, closed, immersed minimal surfaces. This is similar to previous statement we had for, for geodesics. So by using uh, some families of, of cycles that were previously considered by Gromov, we were able to prove this conjecture in the setting of positive curvature. So here's the statement. It's joint with Andre Neves. It says that every compact Riemannian manifold with positive Ricci curvature, such that the dimension is in between three and seven, must contain infinitely many minimal surfaces. And the surfaces are actually embedded from the theory. So this is again based on MIMEX methods applied to this multi-parameter sweep outs that were considered by Gromov. Maybe I'll mention an example next slide. So I should say that Khan and Markovic, who I believe are speaking today, it follows from their work on incompressible surfaces that the result about infinitely many should be true for hyperbolic three manifolds just by minimization. That's sort of like the opposite case where you have enough topology to, to produce minimal surfaces by minimization. Anyway, the, the point is that one, one uses coefficients as E2. This is absolutely crucial. The fundamental group is E2, but the higher homotop groups are all trivial. So there are no non-trivial families parameterized by spheres but these homotop groups are just like the infinite dimensional projective space. So there are families parameterized by projective spaces. So let me give you one example. Maybe I won't have time to, to say much, but let me explain the family at least. Given a most function on my manifold, I define a map C from the k-dimensional projective space to the space of cycles, co-dimension one. The map does the following, it takes a point with projective coordinates A0 to AK. It looks at the polynomial, which has this coordinates as the list of coefficients. Then it takes to the, it sends to the set of zeros of the polynomial composed with F. So in other, wor in other words, you take the surfaces, the union of the level sets of F that correspond to the roots of the polynomial, counted with multiplicities. So one can see that if we multiply the coordinates by minus one, the surface stays the same, but the orientation changes. So in order for, for this map to be well-defined, it's absolutely crucial that we use Z2 coefficients. Anyway, so there is some cohomological condition here, which I won't mention. One performs the MIMAX methods over such case we pulse to get the sequence of, of numbers. The numbers have some sublinear growth. This was proven by Gromov and also by Guth. And the assumption of positive Ricci curvature is only used to imply that two minimal surfaces always intersect each other. So if you think about the theory, this will tell you that each such Mimax number is always achieved by just one single connected component with an integer multiplicity. Then we combine Lucerne Ricci normal ideas to get a contradiction if there are finally many search guys. So I was planning to, uh, to mention some open problems, but maybe because of time, I won't do so. I think Andre is going to talk about those in his lecture tomorrow. So I'll finish here. Thank you.
Thank you very much for the beautiful lecture, Fernando. Are there any questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Fernando again.